Bummer. Tejasvina vadita mastu mavidvishavahai Om shanti 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 May the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good morning and a sweet uh, harbinger of spring today will be warmer here in Atlanta. It'll be nice. So uh, thank you all for being mindful of the time change and being here. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. Very uh, One very hopeful, the other at least planning to be hopeful. The first is that Swami Sarvadevananda, our head minister, plans to be here for a visit from May 17th, May 17th to May 19th. He will be available, he will be available for private interviews and to offer spiritual instruction, including initiation. He expects me to manage his calendar for the visit. So if you wish to talk with him or receive instruction, please email me right away. Please don't call, email me because that way I can use your email to build the list. So email me right away if you want to uh, have an interview with him or receive instruction. Uh, as you know, this can be done through the center's website if you don't already have my email address. And please include in your email your phone number. Uh, not only will I want it, but the Swami will want it. So that's the Swami's visit, May 17th, 18th, and 19th. Uh, he will be offering Diksha or spiritual initiation on the 18th, which is a Wednesday. We hope to have our center open for face-to-face -face gatherings of the congregation on May 1st. That is being evaluated each week. Read your e-newsletter or check the center's Facebook page or website for updates. When we do reopen all classes, and this I want to double underline, when we do reopen for face-to-face -face gatherings, all classes and talks will continue to be offered over Zoom. So those of you who have been very sweetly joining us from remote locations will remain, and we treasure you as, as part of the congregation. <clears throat> so, again, welping, welcome. The topic for this morning is creativity, the art of the matter. Ma 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 bole ma 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 bole dakshina kali kali bole ma 
Dakshina Kali Kali Bulema Ma 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 Bule Ma 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 Bule Sharada Devi Devi Bule Ma Sharada Devi Devi Bule Ma 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 Bule Ma 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 Bule Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. It will be apparent as uh, we go on why this salutation to the divine being in the form of Kali, the Dakshineswar Kali, and, uh, and Sri Sharada Devi. Uh, suffice it to say for right now that uh, the Dakshineshwar Kali uh, made her home in the heart of Sri Ramakrishna and Sri Sharda Devi was born as Saraswati. So creativity, the art of the matter. March is a month for study of karma yoga, a spiritual path leading to abandonment of selfishness. Abandonment of selfishness. As a karma yogi, you practice offering your actions and their results, as well as your perceptions, thoughts, and feelings to the divine presence. In many Ramakrishna mission centers, this prayer is chanted by the congregation in unison at the end of a puja's homophire ceremony, which is the last thing before they do the flower offering and then take prasad. So here's what they chant in part, a part of what they chant in unison. And you'll see the relationship to karma yoga. No matter what I may have done, said or thought, in waking, dreaming, or dreamless sleep, with my mind, my tongue, my hands, or my other members, may all that be an offering to the divine presence. May it all be an offering to the fire of Brahman. So I think you'll see the relevance in offering everything to the Divine Presence as is prescribed by Krishna in his description of Karma Yoga. Even before fully knowing this Divine Presence, as a Karma Yogi, you hold firmly to the belief that the Presence is within each person or other living being that you interact with or serve. Working and abiding in this spirit you are increasingly able to release attachment to your activities and their results. This yields the freedom and contentment promised by Karma Yoga. As Sri Krishna says in Chapter 2 of the Gita, even a little practice of this yoga will save you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. Even a little practice of this yoga will save you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. Since these ideas are so central to what we're going to be talking about this morning, I'd like to pause and ask if there are any comments from your own wisdom or experience or any concern that this raises or any question you'd like to ask. Please, anyone. Let's not go ahead if there's any cloud or anything that you wish to say 
to add from your own experience. This is studying the art of spirituality together. Brother Shankar? Yes, dear. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I have often heard and read the um, term, let everything be an offering to the to Brahman, let everything be an offering to God, give everything. What exactly does that mean? What exactly does that look like? You, you simply verbalize it, Frank. In the beginning, you simply verbalize it. Oh, beloved, this day and all it contains is offered to thee. All actions and their results, all feelings, all thoughts, all perceptions, all moods, all projections, all memories, all reveries, all knots of the heart, all attitudes, all aptitudes, all tendencies, all those things mentioned and all those that might have been mentioned but were not, may all that be an offering to thee and to the fire of Brahman. That's an approximation of the way I begin the day. When you offer your food, when you begin to take some food, you simply say, this food is offered to thee. And then you wait for a little while. If you have a mantra, it's good to chant your mantra during that time. Uh, any activity, any particularly anything that troubles you during the day. Just say, this is what's happening, divine presence. Or whatever the divine presence, if it has a name for you, then of course you would use that name. But say, this, this I'm struggling with this. Whether it be a physical pain, a psychological affliction, <clears throat> or anything that is causing you concern. You simply note that that is happening and offer both your feelings about it and your uh, desire to have this be uh, an offering and taken by the divine and resolved by the divine. Does that get it, Frank? Yes, thank you. Okay. It's, 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 and as you go on, if you do this routinely, day in and day out, what happens is you begin to sense relationship. You begin to sense the acceptance of these things. And particularly when you offer the food. This is one of the first places you'll notice it. You'll notice <clears throat> that as you offer the food and drink, that, there, that there's a little feeling of spiritual energy, of bliss in your body. It just comes as, as a moment. Well, this is, this is the beginning of this sense of in more and more intense and intimate relationship with the Divine Presence. So this is what Sri Krishna says to do. And that the relationship will strengthen, ripen, and you will become very dear to one another. Very good question, Frank. How does it actually work? Anyone else, anything? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Tom. Hi. So uh, a sort of short and concise affirmation prayer or whatever that I've used in the past is simply, may everything I do be something beautiful for God. Mm. Isn't that gorgeous? I, I love like that. It. I like it. So that's say it again. Nothing. Say it again, please. May everything I do be something beautiful for God. Ha ha ha. Wow. <laughs> that is short and to the point, and very to the point. It works for me. 
Yeah, it's, it, it, it would work for anybody who uses it. May everything leave I do be something beautiful for God. Leave it to me to be more wordy about things. <laughs> How does it work when what we are doing is not necessarily, or thinking is not necessarily beautiful? Do we it, it, to God to let it go and to be transformed? You just offer it. it, it Sri Krishna, if you read chapters five and six of the Gita, uh, Frank, you'll see that he, he does not qualify it. He does not put limits on it. As a matter of fact, he's very explicit in naming things that some people regard as shameful or, or, or dirty, like excreting, you know, going to the bathroom. He mentions that specifically, offer it all to me, all of it, the bad, the good, the ugly, offer it all to me. Sri Ramakrishna reaffirms this in, in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And the transformation then becomes spontaneous. You don't have to ask for this transformation. You may, but you don't have to. Thanks for the follow-up. Brother Shankara, this is Haima. Yes, Haima. By abandoning the attachment, you said transformation. Yes, that transformation to me is liberation, liberating yourself, free, free, freeing myself. Let's say, for example, I give some gift or something to somebody, cook a meal. They don't have to thank me. I did it because I wanted to do it. No attachment to the outcome of in return. That liberates me and it's a daily practice for many many years finally i see the result because you have to constantly reaffirm yourself i'm doing it for doing sake not for anyone to thank me not for anyone to hate it like it or anything it's just <laughs> just doing it for doing sake so i put more effort in doing rather than receiving anything beautiful beautiful hymn and as, as is mentioned in the, the Yamas of Patanjali, if a gift is offered with strings attached, you have to offer gratitude. You have to, there's some something that the receiver has to do in return. Then that gift has a question mark beside it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And so, and, and so exactly. in extreme, extreme instances, it should probably not even be accepted. It's it's only when something is offered in that spirit of love and willingness and selflessness that these gifts should be accepted. Thank you, Haima. Right Thank to you. the point. Thank right you, Prashikra. Any anything else from anyone? Uh, the uh, way it works for me. Of course, Brahman is such a vast, vast ocean-like concept. But to break it down at a personal level, if I see everyone in the same way that I see myself, in other words, I see myself in all and all in me, and what that does for me is that I stop judging people, that I operate more on an understanding and empathic level, that whatever are my faults, which I don't see, same way when I see faults in others, I may not hate them, nor judge them and not stop communicating with them. So that gives me a good start. And that's what I read in Bhagavad Gita, that the basic principle of Vedanta is that you identify with every soul 
with every animate or inanimate object in the world. And how freeing that is, isn't it? Yes. How freeing that is when you're not constantly worried about uh, your 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 judgments of others and, and thinking, you know, how could they be fixed and all those things that our left mind will generate. And one more thing that if I see, yes, of course, I have to be realistic. So when I see somebody's gross faults, then instead of judging, I say, I don't want to be like that. Yes. I don't want to take that thing from this person, but I want to focus on what that person has, you know, some good aspects, some benevolent aspects, and I should learn from them. Yes. Because okay. I'm not perfect. How can others be perfect? No, of course. So yes, we observe. We cannot help but observe. Yes. But we, when we relate to the other as the divine presence, yes. it's much easier to find the gold in them find the find the the best in them thank you uma very very astute uh any anything else from anyone before we go on brother shankar yes bhagirat the original sloka from which the translation which you rendered is very very excellent but the sloka reads as kaena vacha manasen riyeva so whether by body, mind, thoughts, or any other way, whatever liberates our psychosomatic complex is a product of the factory of the body and mind. And like all factory products, before it gets into the circulation, somebody inspects, purifies hmm. them, makes them sure that they are fit to go, and then only they are liberated. So if you keep in your thought the mind that whatever I do or whatever I think of, whatever I speak is ultimately going to reach God, automatically you make sure your product is fine and worthy of offering to him. If it is not, keep it with yourself. Yes. You keep your quality control department active. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Bhagira. That's that's great. Okay. Anything else? All right, we'll go ahead. Creativity, the art of the matter. This morning we will talk about the creative imagination and the wonders it can produce as karma yoga, the yoga of action. Karma yoga has to do with our five organs of perception, our five organs of action, and the mind, and behind it the intellect. So <clears throat> the creative imagination expresses itself by using more and more productively and superlatively each of these capacities. This is what we'll explore. So this is why we're talking about this in the context of karma yoga. These 11 cosmic principles, the five organs of action, the five organs of perception, and the five and the and the mind, those 11 of the 24 cosmic principles, uh, and their, uh, their stimulants, the gunas, uh, rajas, tamas, and sattva, uh, are You'll see as they as we work along how these work in. 
your creativity can be one of the greatest joys of life. Creative energy abounds in our world. It is one of the most noticeable aspects. It is create, creative energy is one of the most notable aspects of what Swami Vivekananda calls that infinite energy that lies behind mankind. If you remember in his uh, introduction or to Raja Yoga, he mentions that there is that infinite energy that lies behind mankind. We have only to tap into it. Now, you do not have to be a genius to do this. When I was just a teenager, I used to ride around with my cousin and we would go to a place called Tuxies on Friday night. Tuxies was the place, it was a drive-in where there was the hangout. Now, I had just come from Europe, but <laughs> not so long before. So this was just absolutely a wonderment to me. What was the wonderment? Hot rods. Hot rods, most the most beautifully tricked out cars that you can imagine. <laughs> it was the hangout for the hot rodders. Now, these were not... These were not genius people, but boy, were they creative. Their cars were just absolutely beautiful in their own way. Along with that went drag racing. You know, sometimes they did it illegally on the streets at night, but also, you know, drag racing. What is drag racing? creating the most inventive machines to go as fast as you can over a quarter mile. That's drag racing. Just a quarter mile. And they, they now I have no idea what it's gotten to now, but the, by the time I stopped even noticing, it was well over 200 miles an hour that these cars were going in just a quarter of a mile. Think. How creative you have to be to do that. And then, of course, loud and belligerent music. You know, not, not refined music. A lot of these people <clears throat> feel kind of one down to life, particularly if they're people of color or people of a, of a marginalized race. I used to work at a place in Los Angeles called a place called home. It was an after-school program. It started as an after-school program to keep kids out of gangs that were uh, of Hispanic, primarily Mexican, and, and Black. They had a music department that was amazing. But the music they wrote was reflected the lives that they lived, which were those lives of these marginalized discriminated against young people and it was loud and it was belligerent but they were good and some of them went off to the berkeley school of music and i think it's boston some of them went off to juilliard other fine music schools they were training themselves to become musicians but they were doing it in at first in this really loud, belligerent uh, kind of music. And, you know, in, in another arena of life, which is so familiar to most of us, cooking, <clears throat> uh, the competitions were called chili cook-offs and things like that. How, how inventive can you be in inventing a new kind of uh, chili using the familiar ingredients, but somehow creating something new and, and interesting to the taste. So as I say, you don't have to be of high capability. Now, because of the work that I did 
working for a newspaper uh, in the last part of my career, I also got an opportunity to go to a high end, so to speak, aspect of this. Instead of hot rods, it was vintage cars turned out to a fare thee well, so perfect in every detail. The, the name of these gatherings and their competitions was Concours d'Elegance, uh, a gathering of elegance. And those cars were just absolutely beautiful. Okay, so there's, the, there's that part about it. They, and is there a, 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 a parallel for the drag racing? Yes. It's Formula One racing. Formula One racing, for any of you who know about it, these cars are the most inventive automobiles and, and produce a lot of the innovations that end up in production uh, cars. Formula One racing. And, and uh, it's something that is uh, an, an exercise for the wealthy for the refined um, it's not a quarter of a mile it's something that takes place over hours in, in, in a, in a uh, course that has many turns and uh, challenges built into it and so on and then music many of these same people that had these very remarkable cars in this concours d'elegance and attended Formula One racing there in California, the California Grand Prix and so on. They also were members of musical groups like chamber quartets and so on, where they were expressing themselves and being creative musically. And then, of course, the parallel for the chili cook-off is the haute cuisine. And we, we can find online and, and, and on, the, on the television the very refined cooking shows where they're producing haute cuisine. So this is very much a part of contemporary life. This is this creative expression. It's not something foreign, something that happens only to rocket scientists and uh, uh, the uh, great composers and, and musicians and conductors and artists and so on. No, it has, it's more modest, if you will, aspects. So these are examples from the present time, spoken of from personal experience. But what happens if we think a little about what life was like almost 200 years ago in the 1850s? That's when your great, that's when your great grandparents were alive. The years your grandparents, grand grandparents were born into. <laughs> when we compare life in those years with the world we live in today, what do we notice? We have seen an absolute explosion of change and advancement in medicine, the sciences, the arts aspects of life we might think of as think of as a creative application of knowledge we have seen an explosion of change and advancement in medicine the sciences the arts those aspects of life we might think of as creative applications of knowledge Now you'll see why I sang that little hymn of praise 
to Sri Sharada Devi at the beginning. Sri Sharada Devi, Holy Mother, was born in 1853. Sri Ramakrishna said of her, Sharada is an incarnation of Saraswati, the goddess of learning. She was born to bestow knowledge on others. So who is this goddess Saraswati Devi? Saraswati is the goddess of knowledge, music, arts, and science. Now, as we know, within the Sanatana Dharma tradition, there are many, many embodiments of the divine being as a personal god or goddess. Saraswati is the one responsible for these particular aspects. Now, can we believe this? Well, I'm not expecting you to believe it. Believe it? Of course not. But just take a look at the evidence. Just <laughs> Saraswati is the goddess of knowledge, music, arts, and science. She is the companion of Brahma, also revered as his Shakti, divine power made manifest as the universe we know, or Maya. It was with her knowledge that Brahma created the universe. This is what is taught within Sanatana Dharma, it's Vedic. She is a part of the trinity of Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati. All these three forms help the trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in the creation, sustenance, protection and destruction or transformation of the universe. Chandi hymns, the hymns of the Devi Mahatmyam, the verses to the Divine Mother. Chandi hymns say of her, who is there except you in the sciences, the scriptures, and in the Vedic sayings that light the lamp of discrimination? You are the soul of Shabda Brahma. God in the form of sound, vibration. You are the soul of Shabda Brahman. You are the repository of the very pure Rik and Yajus hymns <coughs> and of Samans, the recital of whose words is beautiful with the Gita. These are the Vedas, you know, the Rik and Yajus, Rik Veda, Yajus, Yajur Veda. Samaveda. So that's the end of the quotes from the Chandi. This is the sacred energy behind the creative imagination and what happens in the universe in, 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 and in our world. This is the sacred energy behind the creative imagination. That's what we're taught by those scriptures. And what happens in universe and in our world when it flows through our minds and bodies. Now I'm going to go on to a great Christian mystic and what he has to say about this. But before I do, I think it's a good time to pause and see if there's anything you'd like to offer uh, from your own wisdom or experience or any concern that this raises, or any thought that you may have that comes in the form of a question. All right. If there's nothing, that's wonderful. Some Shantra, of you, may... yes, dear, Excuse yes, me. Lord. Could you could you uh, explain Shabdam? Is it Shabdam Brahman? Shabda, 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 Shabda Brahman. Shabda means sound or vibration. Shabda Brahman. So Brahman or God, 
uh, the, 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 within the universe, of course, uh, Brahman in the form, uh, in, uh, Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes, the personal God, the immanent God, in the form of sound. So this is why every spiritual tradition has hymns and chants and uh, mantras, other aspects, using sound. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's powerful indeed, as we know. If you listen to the great spiritual music and the spiritual uh, hymns and, and chants of the spiritual tradition that is dearest to you, uh, it moves you, it moves you. One of the expressions, of course, is not just in music, but in poetry. Does that get it, Lori? Anything else? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, anything else from it? Brother Shankara, can you hear yeah. me? Yes, I can. So this is uh, me. Um, Krishna <laughs> Kali. Yes. yes, yes. So this is a wonderful question Lori asked. That Shapta Brahman that we call as being Brahman, being the Shapta, which is sound. Shabda, Shabda. Shabda, which Not is sound. sound yes. Right? Well, vibration, um, yes. Sound. Vibration. And in and the very first line, I believe, of the Bible is first there was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Yes. That's 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 the first. It's not in the Bible, the first words, but it is the first. Uh, it's part of the, the Gospel of John in the New Testament. Yes. The Isn't it amazing that it is across uh, two completely separate cultures and religious traditions? We have all come to the point that the Shabda is Brahman. So can you? That is a really really good question, Lori asks. How is Shabda Brahman? Which means, are you saying all vibration is, sound is equal to vibration, therefore vibration is all Brahman? Is that what they're trying to say? Um, if we believe both the Vedas, if we believe Vashishta, if we, uh, I should say the Upanishads rather than the, but you know, the, the, the Karmakanda of the Vedas, of course, is almost all in the form of hymns and chants and, and mantras. But the Upanishads teach us that reality is made of vibration. Everything outside, which seems to be outside of us, is vibration. Now, modern physics has told us the same thing. I've quoted extensively from the work of a one of the primary physicists working today. His name is Dr. Don Lincoln. He's head of the Fermi lab and part of that group that uh, at the CERN uh, particle accelerator <clears throat> that uh, finally revealed the value of the Higgs boson and so on. Uh, he's, he says, there is nothing, nothing exists except fields of vibration. Infinite fields of vibration. This and this is what I'll talk about at the in the very last talk of our, this month, is this the wonder of this stardust spacesuit that we have that allows us to not only convert these vibrations into the reality we experience, but then return through our own creativity, the, and and become part of the vibrating, you know talking, singing, um, all the things that we do, uh, playing musical instruments <clears throat> that make uh, that uh, are a contribution to this uh, divinity in the form of sound or vibration. Now we, Shabda Brahman specifically refers to that part of the vibratory spectrum that we can hear, that we can hear. Shabda Brahman, God in the form of sound, 
that spectrum of vibration. It is, it is, it is the tool of the musician. It is the tool of the speaker. It is the tool of the poet and the writer. Some delightful stuff at the end of this talk from Mark Twain. That is why they say Saraswati is, at, is in the vocal cords, right? Yes, she sits on your tongue or is in your vocal cords, yes. Yes. Exactly. Oh. Brother Shankara? Uh, yes, dear. Yes, uh, and when you're talking about Shabda Brahman, and it, that is also, they say, is the first sound. Yes. And that was Om. And that's why all the mantras begin with Om, which is the sound of Shabda Brahma, the first and sound, when, sound. And when one becomes sufficiently <clears throat> attuned to the vibratory reality of the universe, you hear that Om sound. Yes. Thank you, Nira, for pointing that out, bringing that into the conversation. Yes. That's why we chant Om all right. Yes. It, 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 it is said to contain it all. Uh, um, mm -hmm. is, is, is the spectrum. If I may Thank add, you. if I may add Brother Shankara, they yes, say yes. there are two, because being in music, we used to learn this in the theory part of it. It said that uh, there's two type of sounds, Ahatnad and Anahatnad. Ahatnad is when it is a struck sound, when two things collide and there's a sound, or there is kind of an agitation and there's a sound. And Anahat Brahma, Anahat Na, there are two Nad is sound. Anahat means Ahat and Anahat means struck and unstruck sound. The unstruck sound in deep meditation only sages can hear. And they say that the lowest, every chakra is, <clears throat> they can hear different kinds of uh, instruments or bell sounds or ocean sounds or the sound of uh, uh, different sounds. The sound of so Shiva's uh, Damaru, Krishna's yes. flute. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, all of these things. So, uh, this is the attunement that comes with the practice of yoga. So the sound that you can hear, which is anahat, which is unstruck, which is spontaneously generated, would I would I be right in saying that I consider the spine to be an elevator? So the lowest. <laughs> yeah, well, probably better described the way it's described in the Hebraic scriptures as a ladder. Jacob Very good. Ladder. Even better. Even better. So I consider it to be a ladder because I feel that the most uh, gross vibrations are at the lowest chakra. And as we evolve as people, as, as, as uh, human beings, we go higher and higher. I mean, not evolve as human beings, as, as species, like going from uh, bird to <laughs> animal to human. So the chakras keep adding, the layers of the ladder keep getting added. And then we, and even in human beings, we are the, like, uh, uh, we have three in us, right? The beast, the human, and the gods. We can take any direction. So I consider the, ba the backbone or the spine, uh, the nervous system to be a kind of a ladder where it depends on your uh, level of uh, evolution mentally and uh, spiritually, you go up to finer and finer vibrations, right? Would yes, that be right yes, in saying I'll, that? I'll, absolutely. And, and if you want to know the details of this, any of you, what uh, Krishna Kali is talking about, read Swami Vivekananda's Six Lessons on Raja Yoga. It's very specific about this. And uh, it, uh, it it tells you how to access this ladder, uh, how to know. But he, he says, you must practice it. You may read about it, but if you wish to practice it, you should do it only under the guidance of a qualified teacher. And if you're going to uh, uh, practice Kundalini Yoga, there are many, many who say they're qualified. Uh, and if you want to know what I mean by qualified, please talk to me about it. I don't want to get into a dissertation about that. But uh, you, there are ways that you can tell who's qualified and who's not. Uh, 
but uh, don't don't study kundalini yoga <coughs> on your own and don't study kundalini with a with a teacher who really doesn't know what he or she is doing anything else dears brother shankara yes dear the last part of the spinal cord is anatomically called corda equina the tail of a horse because it breaks into multiple fibers just like the tail of a horse it is very interesting it is from the same gallop of the horse that panini structured the sanskrit grammar so when you say shabda brahma yes when you say vibrations yes but vibrations are vibrations because in between the vibration there is a pause there is a there is a silence so some people may hear the vibrations some people may hear just a silence oh. and it is, this is the this is the one which uh, krishna kali was talking about that some great sages they may get the same message from meditation which is total silence but they hear the silence to them the silence is eloquent yes absolutely and that's the subject of another talk dear yeah. uh, we 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 won't go into the silence today we're talking about the vibration but you're absolutely right uh as a matter of fact you know meister eckhart the great christian mystic says there is a great silence within us that calls to us it yeah. is very auspicious for us to heed this call mm -hmm. so you're absolutely right so um may i go ahead with john o'donohue now yes okay john o'donohue is a Christian mystic. Can you spell, spell it? Please? Oh, uh, it's O, it, it, it's Donahue, but properly pronounced in Irish, it's Donahue. Uh, D, D, O apostrophe, D O N O H U E, Donahue. Okay, thank you. John O'Donohue. He's a great Christian mystic spiritual philosopher, writer, and surpassingly good poet. Uh, here's some of what he has to say about the fact that he, he acknowledges that this great creative energy is present to us. And then he says, this begins his quote, we have devastatingly <clears throat> neglected the imagination of God, the divine imagination, because that is the true source of all beauty. If you look at God as an artist, then it totally alters what you think about God. If you look at God as an artist, then it totally alters what you think about God. The notion of the divine imagination brings out the creativity of God, and creativity is the supreme passion of God. Excuse me, I seem to have gotten stuck here. I don't know why. <laughs> Sometimes computers are so confusing. <clears throat> okay. The notion of the divine imagination brings out the creativity of God and creativity is the supreme passion of God. And when O'Donohue says this, all we have to do is look around us at the universe. At, uh, just look at the room that you're in, how many things there are there. The, only the divine 
through human instrumentality, sure, perhaps, produced all those things that you see. But uh, you look outside the room <laughs> and within the immediate neighborhood, there is all of this flora and fauna. And then beyond that, so when he says, creativity is the supreme passion of God, yes, everything that is, every tree, but this is still quoting from Odano, everything that is, every tree, bird, star, stone, and wave existed first as a dream in the mind of the divine artist. We are made in the image of and likeness of the divine imagination. The individual imagination is not its own invention. The individual imagination is not its own invention. Its source is elsewhere. The intuition, passion, and luminosity of the, the intuition, passion, and luminosity of the individual imagination are infused with the energy of the divine. Thus, when we enter into our creativity, we are in the rhythm of the divine creator. The divine imagination <coughs> has infused the things of this world with secret depths. We are neither strangers nor foreign bodies in a closed off world. We are the ultimate participants here. The more we give ourselves to experience and strive for expression, the deeper it opens before us. At the deepest level, creativity is holiness. The divine imagination has infused the things of this world with secret depths. We are neither strangers nor foreign bodies in a closed off world. We are the ultimate participants here. The more we give, the more we give ourselves to experience and strive for expression, the deeper it opens before us. At the deepest level, creativity is holiness. Swami Vivekananda, Swamiji, gave a specific example of this holiness when he said, music is the highest form of art, and for those who understand it, the highest form of worship. Now, I have a, a, a short reading from Mark Twain, but I think it's, it's, it's time for, for us to pause and reflect on and, and share how we react to what John O'Donohoe just said about us. Our creativity. I, I, at the very beginning of the talk, I talked about you do not have to be anything special. You don't have to be somebody with a high IQ, a high EQ, a, a natural talent for this, that, or the other thing. I mean, there are hot rods and drag racing and loud belligerent music and chili cook-offs. And then there's concours d'elegance and, and uh, Formula One racing, and chamber quartets made of people who are not uh, professional musicians, and haute cuisine. All this is an expression. All this is an expression of that divine creativity. So where does this leave you? Where are you? What arises in you as a result of all that's been said this morning? I'll say something. Can you hear me? Please, Tom. Yes. Okay, so I love that uh, phrase, creativity is holiness. Uh, 
That's great. And I'll remember that. I'll write it down. For my own self, I'm feeling uh, pretty uncreative these days. A uh, combination of the virus, you know, causing, causing me to be cut off from other people and going out into the world and just old, getting older and having less energy. And then, you know, my recent health problems and surgery and so on. Who knows what? But I, I, I feel frustrated by my lack of creativity. I absorb a lot of other people's creativity. Every time I read uh, or watch a good movie or listen to good music, I'm absorbing somebody else's creativity, but I'm not very creative myself at this point. So that's, that's one of the things that I'm looking at. Thank you. Well, Tom, uh, I, I, I wonder if it's actually true I, I understand your feelings from the very depths and fibers of my being. But I wonder if the way you have learned to cope with your situation of aging and health issues and so on is not in itself creative. And I believe you have created a new relationship. Uh, that is a very creative act. Uh, so I'm, I'm not taking you altogether at your word that you've become uncreative. Perhaps not in the same way that you were when you were such an expert uh, manipulator of uh, computer language but, uh, uh, and, and other forms of expression that you may have. But it is a creative act to learn to cope, to, to, to not just continue our habitual ways of being, but creatively adapt to the new way we must be to be happy and successful in the world. So thank you for sharing. And uh, I, I admire you perhaps more than you do in this respect. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for your thoughts. That's really helpful. Okay. Um, brother, can I ask you something real quick? Please, you can ask me anything you like. Go yes, go over here. Um, so, with, I, I'm, I'm just thinking as we like age and we are not able to do things we passionately were able to do in terms of creation, I think one of the workarounds would be to uh, be more unattached to our own creation. Mm -hmm. Well, because it, it, yes, God's that's, work. That's, that's true. We must be, we must detach ourselves from those things that uh, that are no longer possible for us if we continue to mourn for them and reflect on them and think oh i wish oh i hope i blah 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 blah, blah when it's clearly not going to work and be practical uh, not only is it a, a fairly inauspicious waste of our time but it just keeps us uh pulled downward into this yes it, it holds us back because yes. God is in us and he's going to be doing, he's going to help us create other things, which we probably didn't know was possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. And, and, and we'll talk about that very much. There are two more talks that are just in a direct through line from this one this morning, two more talks this month. The next one is, Sri Krishna and the Fool on the Hill. Um, the, the Fool on the Hill, of course, is a very famous Beatles tune written by Paul McCartney. Uh, that uh, there are so many parallels in that song to how Sri Krishna describes himself in chapters four through six of the Gita, uh, that it, it, it's really uh, fun. Uh, and I'm not going to give away the, the punchline to the, to the talk, but the, it, it, so that's a through line, how this, all of this actually falls out in practice uh, and in sometimes in very stressful situations. Uh, it, it is the most, the most beautiful creativity will emerge. And then the, at the end of the month, uh, this talk on, the wonder of our of your the wonder of your stardust spacesuit. What is it 
that you have at your command. And it is purely awesome, not only how it was created, <coughs> but what it is. And, uh, you know, it goes, it goes far beyond what most of us think about most of the time. And it's not like we're bad and wrong for not thinking about it. We're preoccupied with other things. That's the job of people like myself to think about these things and, and share them. So uh, the wonder of your stardust spacesuit. So thank you, Gaurav. Anything else from anyone before we go on to this lovely reading from Mark Twain? Uh, Brother Shankara? Yes. To this, is this is Cassandra. Yes, Cassandra. Um, there's a quote from a shaman teacher that I've worked with for a while that I would like to share that seems to echo what you've been teaching here about creativity. Please. And she, she said that creativity is, in a sense, the only prayer. When you begin your creativity, you begin your dialogue with the great spirit. It is then that you set yourself aside and begin your spiritual life. When you create, you don't think about what you do. Instead, you pray to the great spirit to express goodness through your hands, through your conceptualization of your art and what it is going to be like as a manifestation in this world. And yeah. I, I particularly like the part about setting ourselves aside. And I, during the pandemic, I took up photography just around my home at going out walking with a camera and I noticed after I would go out and take pictures, looking back on the experience, I really felt empty in a good way. Like there was not conversation going on in my head. I was just perceiving what was in front of me and looking at what was in front of me. And there was very little chatter. And I found that I felt healthier. I felt more grounded and more connected to my own spiritual connection to, to whatever, <laughs> to the great spirit. But um, it seemed to echo some of the things you were teaching today. And I, I thank you for your talk. Oh, well, and thank you, Cassandra, for, for what you just said and how resourceful you were to take up photography uh, during this time that we're so limited in other ways. And what you said about setting yourself aside, that's exactly what's meant in this definition that was read at the beginning about abandoning selfishness uh, and why creativity is an exercise in karma yoga. Yes. It's exactly what you just said and your shaman teacher, bless her, said. Uh, so yes, thank you. And I, and I really admire your resourcefulness in taking up photography as a way to continue your creative expression and your engagement with uh, you know, a, a positive auspicious engagement with your environment and what's around you beautiful thank you so much all right because somebody Cassandra else wanted to talk at the same time uh, there was somebody else who wanted to talk at the same time as Cassandra. Let's give them a shot first. Somebody was speaking up at the same time she started. Cindy. No, that wasn't me. Or it oh. was me just now, but somebody else. Who was it? Well, if they don't want to speak up, that's fine. Lori. Lori, speak up, Lori. Are you there? I'm, I'm here. I was just wondering if Cassandra could please repeat that wonderful quote. Um, surely I will. Um, and this, this is not in a book. It was actually in a handout from a class um, that we had many years back. So I'm just reading it from a handout. It's not actually published any place. Can you put that but, in the group chat, please? Is it possible? Yes, I can. I will. Yeah, After I repeat it, I'll go let, into the chat. Yeah, let her say it first before we. OK. Um, creativity is, in a sense, the only prayer. When you begin your creativity, you begin your dialogue with the great spirit. Hmm. It, is, it, it is then that you set yourself aside and begin your spiritual life. When you create, you don't think about what you do. 
Instead, you pray to the great spirit to express goodness through your hands, through your conceptualization of what your art is going to be like as a manifestation in this world. Thank you. Now, if you will type that into the chat so people can copy it. Yes, I will. Thank yeah. you so much. And, and someone else, was, was it Cindy that wanted to speak? Yeah, um, I have so many thoughts, I'm going to try to wrangle them right now. <laughs> we'll wrangle them with you. But kind of starting with what Garab said about, you know, having passion for certain creative activities early on and aging and having less passion, um, and also what Cassandra just said and kind of what a lot of people are talking about here. Um, I think that, you know, if those of us who find some sort of, you know, obvious creative artistic outlet early on in our lives, um, that of course, as we've been saying, isn't the only kind of creativity, but it's what we look at as, oh, they're a musician or a composer or a writer or whatever. But even those people, unless they, you know, stick to it as a career lifelong, they may, you know, their life takes them other places. But what was in them that made them do the do that creativity early on, that doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, oh, I haven't picked up the, I haven't played the piano in 20 years. It's gone. Well, it's not gone because you may never play the piano again, but that creativity is still there. And if you allow for it, allow God, the universe, however you can conceptualize, but that thing that is not you, it is so much bigger than you, that creativity, if you allow it. <coughs> to come out in everything in your life, you know, not just your art or your hobby mm -hmm. or your, you know, avocation, but in everything, because every moment, right this second, we are creating this. Yes. And none Precisely. Of us, none of us could create this on our own. And if one of you was not here, even those of you who, who aren't talking, you know, or showing your face, it's different. It is exactly what it is right this second because all of us are here and we are allowing life itself to come forth, which is the most creative thing. And, and that is the creative thing, life itself. So that's, a, so, that's what O'Donohue points out. Okay. Well, I don't know if that led anywhere, but I just, I just wanted to. To, to say that. And oh, one other thing is, I have, those of you who know me, I have been a musician and songwriter and was very serious about it at times in my life. And at one point, I quit playing altogether, didn't pick up an instrument for seven years. And the early days, I was all about, you know, I'm going to go to Nashville, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, you know, be a rock star, or whatever. Um, but <laughs> after that seven year break, and when I came back to it, it was totally totally different. I didn't, I not only didn't care about, you know, the fame and fortune, I really did not want that. I wanted to play with other people for enjoyment and for us to play for audiences so that they would feel better when they went home. And <laughs> that attitude was totally different from the one I had early on. And it just not only made a difference in the music and my enjoyment, but it was just yeah, and so that was offering this it, results of the music, not to, oh, it's mine and it's me and I'm going to be blah, 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 but giving it away. Yes. It, it made all the difference in the world. Okay, I'm done. It's offering it to the divine presence. Even though we don't, we may not think about it in, in that moment. Anything else from anyone? Yes. May I? May I? Add? Of course, Uma. First, yes. Oh my gosh. First of all, such beautiful ideas are expressed here. Each one delights me. Each mm -hmm. one makes me so much. I mean, 
in love with life. <laughs> Expression itself, the topic is so inspiring. And uh, I feel like expressing in words of uh, Wordsworth, who said, um, what is, yeah, what is art? What is poetry? It's a spontaneous overflow of powerful emotion in tranquility. I think my words are correct, but that's what we learned years and years and years ago in our poetry class. And <coughs> how I love it is the con <coughs> connection between art, creativity, and divinity. And that is interwoven in all Indian music. Any artist, any <coughs> comes on this stage, first touches Bowes down to this stage and takes the, you know, does like this to express thankfulness to God that what comes out of my mouth, what I think, what I express is nothing but prayer to God. And God works through me. So what it does is takes away your ego. And the artist feels puffed up, oh, I'm this, I'm that. It takes away that I-ness, that ego, that puffing feeling of self-importance, that what I'm doing or what I'm, comes out of me is an expression of God. And I am only an instrument of God. So that, that is very powerful, that a creativity of any kind is an offering to God. And as uh, Krishna says in the Gita, let it be not for yourself alone, but for the welfare of the world. So just like you said, unselfish, it's just a spontaneous expression of joy. And that uh, uh, reminds me of a two-year-old. Have you, we all have seen how at that age children just spontaneously dance. They don't care who is watching. They don't care if they're perfect in their rhythm, in their beats. They just dance. And they are just they seem like nobody is watching. That to me connects with what Cindy was telling. That what if you lose it, but it's in your heart. And as long as you feel it alive, that creativity is also the feeling of being alive and connecting with God and everybody. And last, I would like to read four lines of Wordsworth, Tintern Abbey, very beautiful poem. Uh, Wordsworth says, I have felt a presence that disturbs me with joy, a presence that disturbs me with joy, of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime, of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and this round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion, a spirit that impels all thinking things all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. That motion, that spirit. Thank you, Uma.
that's beautiful. Wordsworth can always be counted on to uh, to uh, bring things into focus and, and lift us up. So I'm going to read this from Mark Twain. It's Mark Twain on creativity and happiness. And this is from Leslie Yarborough's blog, which is published at creativitymarket.com, creativitymarket.com. Uh, this is the quote from Yarborough, and then he'll go into Twain. In the wonderful book, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, the main character muses on the differences between manual and intellectual work and the personal happiness to be found in the latter, that is to say, the intellectual work. So here's Twain. The intellectual work is misnamed, Twain says. The intellectual work is misnamed. It is a pleasure, a dissipation, and its own highest reward. The poorest paid architect, engineer, general, author, sculptor, painter, lecturer, advocate, legislator, actor, preacher, singer, is constructively in heaven when he is at work. And as for the imagination, or as, and as for the magician with the fiddle bow in his hand, when he is in the midst of a great orchestra, with the echoing and flowing tides of divine sound washing over him. Why, certainly he is at work, if you wish to call it that. But Lord, it is a sarcasm just the same. <laughs> so this is Twain celebrating what happens when we yield to that creative energy that is at the heart of the fact that there is a universe itself. And it is the work of Saraswati, as it's, it's said in that quote from the scriptures, that it is with her knowledge that this is all created. And as O'Donohoe pointed out so beautifully, the divine imagination and the creative energy is at the very heart of our being. And when we let it flow, oh joy, oh joy. And that's what Twain was just pointing at. It's not work at all. Sure, we labor at it. You know, that's what the left mind is for, mm -hmm. to take that creative impulse and turn it into the creative form, the formed creation. So with that, dears, is there any final thought from anyone? Uh, yeah, uh, I had thought about like, a couple things. Something Cindy had said about quitting the music for a while. I was reminded how John Lennon had quit for a while once he got disillusioned with the whole Beatles thing. Well, then he got back into it and wrote some really great stuff. But you had said earlier than that about just dealing with the challenges of life. You have to be creative. And I tend to agree with that because life keeps changing. It keeps throwing new challenges at you, new problems for you. So just as an example, as a homeowner, I recently had to replace a broken thermostat and replace a broken kitchen sink and uh, build a cat tree. And all these things required some level of creativity. So I couldn't just like follow on the old, uh, follow the instructions. We had to be creative to figure out the Yes. It is, it, if we respond creatively to the challenges of life, rather than habitually or not at all, 
uh, there is there is joy, not just in the results. There may be some joy in the results, but what we find is there is great joy in the act itself. And as Cassandra pointed out from her teacher, but she affirmed it on her own, we lose ourselves. We lose our sense of small self and find ourselves in the wonder of the divinity within us that expresses itself as the creative impulse and imagination that O'Donohue spoke of so eloquently. So thank you, Brahmadas. Yes. So when we are facing a challenge or a problem that we seem totally frustrated, unable to solve, is it okay to repeat our mantra and ask for divine guidance? Oh, is it okay? My God, man, it is, it is your greatest resource and tool. You know, by all means, <laughs> by any means. You're, you're looking for, you're looking for that divine energy, that divine focus, that divine concentration. As, as Vivekananda says, it is only through that infinite energy expressed as concentration that anything wonderful happens in this world, a scientific breakthrough. What did Dr. Richard Feynman say? Dr. Richard Feynman was asked, Oh, Dr. Feynman, what do you know about God? What can you tell us about God? The interviewer asked in a rather pompous way. And Dr. Feynman very sweetly and humbly said, well, you know, I don't know anything at all about God, but I do love Mother Nature and I implore her to share her secrets with me. So he was giving the source of the discoveries that he wrote down and the, he gave them form through mathematics and language. But he's, he was recognizing the source. I implore her to share her secrets with me. So Can that, I say is, the, that is the source. Uh, may I respond to Brahmadas for a minute? Uh, please, Brahmadas? please do. I'll just tell a quick uh, statement made by uh, Swami Sarvapriya Nanda was. He made it, put it so simply. He said, think of all the thoughts that you've thought in the day. You will find that either they are frustration, anger, uh, apathy, or mundane stuff, or anything that's not uh, productive, or maybe it's just regular stuff, but think about the mantra of all the things that you think. Isn't mantra the purest of thoughts? And why don't you just enter your mantra? Replace any extra thoughts that you don't need. Just eliminate them and just think about your mantra. That's the highest thought of all the thoughts you think in the day. So I've kept that in mind that if anything saying, comes think of your is, mantra, is that what you're saying? Think of your he, mantra. He, yeah, yes. Sarvapriyananda okay. said that, that, that. Think of all the thoughts in the day. None of that would really hold much for very long. I mean, you've got to get your stuff done. But he said, think about the month as the highest thought you can think in the day. So anytime you're not doing anything, just think about it mentally and it'll keep all the other frustrating thoughts out and it'll just keep your mind clear and elevated. Swami Krishnananda, right. Swami Krishnananda, who was the Swami, who was the personal assistant of Swami Prabhavananda, my guru, uh, <clears throat> he uh, had a pride of place, so to speak, uh, in washing the dishes in the evening so that they would be done with the proper care. And they were in the kitchen one evening and Swami Krishnananda was at the sink with his back to the rest of the monks who were in the kitchen. And they were drying the dishes and putting them away and they were chatting, chat, 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 chatting. 
and the chat turned to complaining something complaining about something and once one person starts complaining it's easy for other people to jump on that train so they that began to and krishnananda who was very very quiet most of the time didn't say much he stopped he turned around and he gave them a very level look and he said is there something wrong with your mantra <laughs> That's so beautiful. yes, yes, it is. That's why it's made a mark on my heart. Is there something wrong with your mantra? So yes, whenever we our thoughts are errant, discursive, certainly if they're unpleasant, if you can, if you can just stop yourself, restrain your mind for a moment, and very deliberately replace that with your mantra you'll over time you'll find that the positive that satchidananda energy satchidananda brahman energy will replace itself in your because you've gone to your heart you've gone to your heart our left mind is a troublesome place it's both a friend and a troublesome friend. Anything else from anyone before we close? Brother Shankar, I have a question, if I can ask you. You certainly. Um, so I agree that uh, there's a sort of infinite source of creativity within us all that is accessible through um, you know, getting in touch with God or divine being. But I was wondering if uh, the Rishis or the Vedas um describe what talent is and why some of us have more afflictions towards certain subjects or certain uh, abilities i guess the the, the 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 upanishads speak very clearly about the fact that talent is simply the result of practice in repeated lifetimes you come in mozart was able to play the violin at age four and composed by age six. If, if you ask for an explanation, I mean, when I say Mozart played the violin, if you read the, the story of his life, he was playing very successfully at age four. And you know, talk about child prodigy. And then he was composing at age six. Well, the explanation from the Rishis would be that he brought this forward. And the Buddha said, you know, he didn't, he, he disclaimed, he, the Buddha disclaimed being an avatar. He said, no, no, what expressed itself in this lifetime was the result of 499 prior lifetimes. He actually gave a number. This is the result of 500 lifetimes. Yes. But it's very interesting that the arts and sciences of Japan simply do not, they say, yes, you may be talented, but if your zeal is such that you really want to accomplish something in science or in the arts, you can bring that forward all that energy is there and so don't say i have to be talented in poetry before i can write poetry no they say practice 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 and you will become proficient at poetry perhaps even excellent so I, it's one of the things that i learned from i don't know whether it was in flesh Zen bones one of those books a long time ago. I hope that answers the question, Roberto. Thank you, yes. Anything else from anyone? I think if I can add, uh, when Aurobindo's, um, uh, uh, you know, mother from uh, Pondicherry Ashram, Aurobindo's uh, uh -huh, the, the mother, the mother. The mother who 
she was asked this question and her answer was very very interesting she said talent and skill is only that when you put a flashlight on something only that much gets illuminated right so each one of us has proclivities we have uh, things that we like suppose somebody likes color they look at the color in all of the things they see around them they they gravitate towards that so it's just like you put a flashlight on something you want to see minutely or more carefully or more uh, 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 focused that's what talent is you have now zeroed in only on sounds because sounds fascinates you it's what you prop proclivities are suppose color fascinates you look at everything colorful you look at the shades of color if you if you, if shape uh, shape fascinates you you start creating uh, clay things or uh, forms if movement fascinates you you look at movement in dance so basically it's just what you are drawn to we somebody who's not a singer will not listen to sounds as carefully as a singer will so all you are doing is using your faculties and and putting your flashlight shining on one thing that draws your attention anything that draws your attention from childhood you are watching it you are Im- imbibing it and then you are becoming better it's not that you don't ha- have any interest towards sound and suddenly you become a singer you're already prone to listening to the different inflections of sounds that's why singers are good uh, good at many languages they are so attuned to listening to the finer inflections of voice that they can sing in multiple languages why because it's the first the interest in the sound came in and there then then came the interest then came the talent of uh, the explicit um, uh, explicit uh, uh, demonstration of their love for the sound is coming through the music So basically, you. whatever you focus your light on, that's what you become good at. That's Thank that. you, Krishna Kali. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's from choir practice. <laughs> so, dear hearts, this has been such a joy. Yes. 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 creativity the art of the matter our universe is made of mind and matter this is the nature of maya so our creative impulse allows us to practice the art of the matter let there be peace in outer space let there be peace in the sky on the earth and in the waters let there be peace in the herbs the plants and the trees may the gods be peaceful may the whole universe be pervaded by peace let that infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being Om shanti 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 peace 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 be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere Jai Shri Guru Maharaj ji ki jai Durga 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 May we be safe may we be healthy May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So for any of you who wish to join us, there are the classes on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Monday we're still finishing up with Tukaram in Love Poems from God. Tuesday we're pursuing uh the, the uh, we're about to oh, I don't know two thirds or so the way through the book on Holy Mother's life talking about her as uh the offerer of liberation. Um that's on Tuesday and then on Wednesday we're in Swami Vivekananda's talk in Gyana Yoga the real and the apparent man and if you haven't ever heard that talk that is or read that talk 
uh, I cannot recommend it highly enough. It really puts into perspective this appearance and the reality behind it. Then, of course, on Saturday, those classes start at 730. Uh, on Saturday, we continue to pursue uh, Swami Prabhavananda's How to Know God, his translation of and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Uh, we're on, uh, we're still very early on in the book, chapter 1, Sutra 17. And uh, then, as I said, next Sunday, the talk will be Sri Krishna and the Fool on the Hill. Any final thought or comment or question from anyone? All right, dears. Inexpressible joy being among you this evening, this, this afternoon, I mean. So, um, until next time. Jai Thank Ma. you. Thank you, dear Sean. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Well, Bye. You're most welcome. Thank you. You know, this yes. is this is emphatically a two-way street. <laughs> yeah. Creative. Yes, creative. <laughs>